with this record with your volume going up and down? Oh, I have no idea. <laughs> we'll find out, won't we? Uh, I don't know why it's going up and down either. But, so let's pray. Father, we just ask that you would just work through the logistics right here and take care of the ups and the downs and all that kind of good stuff. And that, Lord, that you would just guide us this evening, even as you have this week, as we've been examining your word and seeking out your truth, uh, seeking your mind, really desiring to know what it is that you have revealed and what you have for each one of us for such a time as this. Uh, Father, I pray that you'll continue to uh, be with us and reveal our truths to us, and you'll do so even now. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So tell me quickly, how did your study go this week? What were we looking, studying about? Israel and the Lord, good, good. Uh, Israel and the Lord's return, okay. Uh, what about Israel and the Lord's return? <laughs> uh, I guess it is, Karen, yeah, it is. Yeah, what about the different views? This week, in the homework, they actually gave you a, a list. Of, I've given you several charts right here. This is all just for y'all's benefit, just how that goes. Um, what about the different views? I'm trying to see if I can pull this one up right here. If you can see it, and I can still see the chat. <clears throat> Here's the, uh, can y'all read that, basically? Um, this is a useful little chart, which is sort of a synopsis of the four basic views. And the beginning down at the bottom is the one referred to as preterist. You see the name on the left, how Revelation is viewed, and then more about it. Um, you saw the explanation of the preterist, the idealist, the historicist, and the futurist. For lack of a better way of expressing it, which one do you, of these do you think is the correct one? Is that rude in saying it that way? Experiences future. Is there disagreement within the body of Christ over this? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there really is. Um, and as we uh, often say, I don't think it's something that you separate fellowship over. Which would, um, allow harm to come within the body. Uh, yes, definitely. Even within each one of the schools of thought. Uh, all of those, there's things within each one of those that uh, I would say I disagree with. <laughs> so, yeah, there's, there's, there's tremendous uh, diversity. Uh, I don't think there's quite the need for the diversity that, is, uh, that we see. Uh, why do you think there is such a difference of opinion? Yeah, hermeneutics. Is, what's that fancy word there, Karen? What do you mean by that? Can't figure out how anyone can think we are living in the thousand year millennial reign. Uh, the whole reason for that, when you can't really think, figure out why somebody's thinking a particular kind of way, it usually boils down to the fact that they view that as a, a metaphor or a picture or a type, and it's not a literal thousand years. Allegorical, there you go. And it, you know, yeah, 
that's the bottom line with all these things. Um, and I've had two or three uh, occasions today, and even more yesterday, uh, to where people just say things in passing, and it sounds very correct biblically, and it sounds very, and people just sit there and go, "Oh yeah, that's right, that's right." And you just tell the way they're receiving uh, that word, but it's not what the scripture says, and it really is. Just as simple as that. Quite often, it's just what the scriptures say. Um, with what be because of current events here? How they're approaching the word? No, uh, some of this is uh, teaching. Uh, some of it's preaching. Some of it's just uh, discussion. Um, had a great discussion for about five minutes while I go with a piano student. He's a young adult. And uh, he just sort of said two or three things in passing. And I just thought, well, that's just wrong, you know. And, uh, and so, you know, particularly when they're piano students, I always take the opportunity to say, hey, here's what this is. This is what the word said. He says, well, that's what I mean. And I said, well, I know that's what you meant, but it's not what you said. Oh, well, hey, Carol. Let's see you jump on. Yeah, you're going to have a lot, uh, even more of uh, revelation teaching <laughs> and a lot of revelation correcting in people's lives nowadays. Uh, but anyway, futurism is, uh, futurist is probably uh, the view best. A lot of times people say we'll interpret it, what we see in, in prophecy. And what is meant by futurist? Well, according to this right here, it says that all and nearly all of revelation is yet to occur. Even that, I can argue, is a lot of things that you see in Revelation that are um, things that are apparently are occurring in heaven right now. And there's things that are yet to come, but so often we forget about the things that are occurring right now. But I know what they mean. And so the idea with the future is that the bulk of it is. Um, um, can you still hear me, Rachel? That's the other side of the world there. Okay, that's no problem. Um, these charts right here, let me just make this one a big screen, okay? I won't be able to see your chat. Uh, well, hi, Dad. Uh, you'll see three charts that say comparing views in Revelation 1, 2, and 3. And these are sort of useful because what they do is they break down each one of these uh, uh, schools of interpretation and each one of these schools of thought and s sort of give you an example of how they would interpret uh, a portion of a chapter or a chapter in Revelation or a particular subject matter uh, in that chapter in Revelation. There we go. I hope that's popping up on y'all's side. So right here is the, uh, uh, the futurist, the historical, uh, idealist, preterist, uh, Revelation 1, Revelation 2 and 3, Revelation 4, 5, 6. Uh, it's not really an attempt to cover everything within each one of those chapters, but it's useful because it shows you uh, for instance, uh, how does the futurist in Revelation 6 interpret the seals? How does the historicist? How does the idealist? And so these three charts cover all of Revelation just to sort of give you an idea. Uh, and this right here in and of itself is an interesting read. Just took the time to read through and see. And you start to really uh, see how convoluted the interpretation has to get once you sort of stray away from the Word of God. And when you say something is a, uh, a spiritual thing rather than uh, just literally what it says that it is, you can really start getting into uh, all sorts of interpreted trouble. So anyway, is everybody still here with me? Everybody say hi. Hey, Sabrina. Sabrina, we're having uh, technical difficulties. Maybe having problems on my end. I may have, uh, have I pulled this on you yet? Have I told you about ID10T problems? I think I have because somebody here knew about that. Y'all know what an ID10T problem is. Oh, 20 years ago, uh, a guy, I was having problems with a computer, and that's back when you used to open them up and actually had to move jumpers around. And I called a friend that had built this computer for me, and he said, oh, man, you got an ID10T problem. And I said, what in the world is that? And he said, um, well, get your piece of paper out. And write it down. So I wrote down the number ID, then the number 10, and then the number T. And 
That's what I got. <laughs> so he was uh, uh, lovingly and compassionately he called me an idiot because of what I was trying to do on my computer. <laughs> then it turns out it's a pretty common thing in computer parlance. <clears throat> so I experience ID10T problems all the time. So let, let's press on. You did a lot of cross references and seeing what the bottom line is uh, with Israel and what's uh, happened with Israel. What did you learn from Romans chapter 11? God hasn't rejected Israel. That basic foundational truth right there, is that only for the time when Paul was writing that, that or is that for today? Good, God hasn't rejected them. They're only partially blinded, partially hard in the heart. So Israel is the branch root that the Gentiles have been grafted into. So what does that mean, Sabrina? Covenant keeping of God? You'll have to remind me what the reminder was, Karen. Oh, okay. Yes, Sabrina. Part of the covenant with the Lord. Oh. Uh, which covenant with the Lord? Yeah, what do you make of that, Rachel? Um, you see here that he hasn't rejected the people, that he has a remnant. Do most people in the body of Christ believe that today of the nation of Israel? Yeah, there's a huge portion of the body of Christ that believes that God has divorced Israel, and that's it. No longer dealing with it. Uh, there's a big portion that believes that the church has replaced Israel, even to such a degree that you'll run in the commentaries when uh, writing about Romans 9, 10, and 11. Um, yeah, that's the official term of replacement theology. That the church has replaced Israel. That they will substitute the word church for every time they see Israel. And uh, you try that, and you, it gets really, really sloppy. Uh, I mean, real sloppy. I don't know, Karen. You think most of the church believe that? Okay, then you think most of the denominational? Um, but not down under. I, I, I'm, I'm finding out more and more. I think most uh, the denominational churches what they uh, believe. I think the denominational stances sort of reflect that, the way they act and behave. But uh, individuals themselves are basically clueless. So Spring says they're still saved in the same manner as Christians. When they become Christians, you know, grafted back in, and in the end times, very significant. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really pretty common. Uh, the Methodists, the Baptists and Methodists around here are, the Baptists are supportive of the nation of Israel. <laughs> no, they don't talk about it, no doubt. But um, if you were to ask them about this, they really don't know. And particularly the Baptist churches, I grew up in around this area, 
if you were to tell them, well, the scripture shows you that even after the church is taken out, that there's going to be Jewish people that will be saved. If you use it in that language right there, they won't believe you. They won't do that. Because they're convinced that uh, that the rapture is it. If you don't get on board the gospel train at that moment, you're out of it. And so uh, back up to something that Rachel said earlier that, um, I think it was Rachel, uh, yeah, that there's some who believe even now out of the remnant who were chosen, but there's some whose hearts are hardened. So, you know, from what you see uh, in your study this week, that when they look upon him, they will believe, okay, the partial hardening is till the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. How does that partial hardening come about? What is that? Okay, yeah, they, they rejected the Lord. That rejection literally resulted in salvation for the non-Jews. And then Paul goes on to explain that, that the Gentile salvation actually makes Israel, the Jewish people, jealous. Yeah, there you go, Rachel. <laughs> Which will lead to their salvation. Our salvation. Ultimately theirs. So what does verse 26 say there? Rachel, what did you like about that? Oh, all Israel will be saved. Sabrina, you have any more insight into what that word all means? Okay. <laughs> See what uh, Sabrina said. I think uh, same process. Pharaoh. Oh, okay. Yeah. And even what he said in, in uh, Romans one in the same letter when he said God gave him over and God gave him over and God gave him over, gave him over the desires and lust their flesh. Um, there will be only a third. We'll see that in just a minute over in Zechariah. That only a third that make it, uh, and it's a third of those that are in on the land, I think is the way it's expressed. Uh, the other two thirds with, all, all, with all Israel being saved, um, wouldn't that be all who are truly Israel, maybe? Not just by name, but in faith as well? Uh, I could buy that. <laughs> I guess, you know, I've just uh, assumed for years that they all referred to everybody that was um, that had made it all the way through, that was all there, and they, everyone that was there would believe. And um, and I believe that to be true. But I'm suspecting some more nuances. Uh, well, because we know we ahead, know that not everybody who says they're, they're Israeli is uh, truly a believer. Well, you get to this thing that not everybody who lives upon the land of Israel is Jewish and a believer. It's a large Arab population that are um, Muslim or something else. Yeah, no doubt. I think that's what the bottom line is, Rachel, that when they see him, what you saw in the uh, passage in Zechariah 2, was it Zechariah? Um, so they will look upon him whom they pierced. Okay, that, that's been the idea that they will know. So anyway, they will be uh, regrafted back in. They will be included. Uh, you saw the picture of the uh, grafting into the branches in the tree, the olive tree. And uh, Interesting, as Paul is writing this, as the Spirit is moving through Paul, and he's writing to a group of people in Rome that he'd never met before who were Gentile. And he was just giving them a forewarning there about, you know, just because a limb broken off and you were grafted in place, don't think that God will not, could not do the same thing with you and graft back in the original. And so it's sort of a, a hint that God may be doing that. I think that's it. He's not finished with Israel. And, uh, but it's, You'll, you'll hear that he is so often. Now, uh, some you know the pendulum swings too far. All these things. Those that support Israel, 
if you tell somebody that you support Israel and you support the Jewish people, well, then they think that you believe from a political sense that you support everything and that whatever Israel wants and whatever Israel wants you to do, that you need to do that. Well, that's not the same thing. Uh, I, I can I can totally and absolutely support Israel argue over whether we should be selling vast amounts of F-16s uh, or whatever it may be. I understand people's arguments for some of those things. Uh, particularly when you see what happens in the last times. But anyway, what's going to happen when they look upon uh, uh, the one who said that they would be saved? Yeah, isn't that interesting? The liver will come. He'll come from Zion. Notice that. Notice he'll come from Zion. We'll remove all ungodliness. We'll take away their sins, literally. So are uh, are the Jewish people still God's chosen people? Yeah, they are. Does that mean that we are or not? Is that even a question to be asked in that way? Excuse me. Yeah, we're adopted in, we're grafted in, in a number of terms. So, God is not finished with the nation of Israel. That's the reason we need to pay attention to what's happening, what's going on there. Now, let's press on here. Uh, you did a lot of reading through Matthew 24. Uh, if you're looking, all of us have done all the parts of uh, Revelation of this part. That's what Karen said. You know in the Quran there's not a word, a concept for adoption. Oh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't doubt that at all. So, what was the homework that they wanted y'all to do from Matthew 24? I meant to have that in front of me, and I don't. So, uh, what was it that was the assignment for me? Okay, how was it worded right there, Rachel? Do you remember? I might have to reach down. Got all my revelation homework in one notebook. So you can imagine, it's sort of heavy. Okay, this is what you learned about Israel with respect to the second coming of Christ. What did you learn about Israel in respect to the second coming of Christ? Israel have a temple. And what does verse 29 say there, Spring? I need a bigger desk. <laughs> oh, the Son of Man will appear. Yeah, the Son of Man and the Star is going dark. Rachel, 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 you are always great with the questions, aren't you? Are the Jews included in the word elect? The days cut short. Great trumpet will gather together his elect. Before we have why wouldn't they be? Anything else? Throw it all up there.
people living in Judea at that time would need to flee. Anything else? Yeah, the example of two men, one taken, one remaining. <clears throat> Thank you, Rachel. What do you mean by that in relation to Israel? I think we can actually be prepared in. You know what my answer to this question was? And the question was, which I had a fair at the top page. Uh, Sabrina's got it. List what you learned from Matthew about Israel respect to the second coming of Christ. In Matthew 24, I didn't learn anything about it. But I learned how people can manipulate and how they can lead with questions and how you can lead with words. And you got to be really careful how you do things. Otherwise, you infer things. Um, what was the stupid question, Spring? That question? Uh, the question about um, how you, what you learn about Israel. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Stupid yeah. question. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I read that question. I thought, well, let me, let me go back and read through it again. And I thought, I don't like the way this is because it's asking you to make an assumption about some things. And it's really setting you up, leading you in the direction that they want to go for something. And uh, so there wasn't anything. Now there are some things there, yeah. Uh, at the beginning, let me let me just share this right here. I've got the, you know, as as all y'all know, uh, there's a teacher um, um, leader's guide uh, for all these classes, and it's useful. You know, it's a good outline and things like that. But just listen, to what happens here? The first thing they say is Jesus told his disciples about the destruction of the temple in A.D. 70, but focused on the end of time. Well. Now, if I said that to y'all in that way, it's going to lead you in a wrong. Jesus didn't prophesy and say the temple was going to be destroyed in A.D. 70, okay? which is the way this is written. He did say there's not going to be a stone left unturned and it would be destroyed. But words mean things, and the sequence in the words mean things, infer things. And then he, you know, he comes along and he gives a, a repeated warning about not being misled, right? Absolutely true. He said, let no one mislead you. He said, many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and you can interpret that as I am the Messiah, and will mislead many. And then the precept people say this, who would be most likely to be misled by a false Messiah? And they say the answer is Jews. What do you think of that, Spring, that little inference? Well, in, in verse 15 it says, it does talk about when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel and the, the prophet, and you do also see during the tribulation that there uh, many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another and false prophets will arise and mislead many. But that doesn't mean, it doesn't really mean, it doesn't really mean what they said. Yeah, it doesn't mean it doesn't, anything. It doesn't mean that it's limited to the Jews. That's what's, that's what's trying to be communicated. That this passage is exclusively spoken and addressing that's what the agenda is. And you will run into that a lot. Yes, false prophets will come and they will go, and many Jews and many non Jews okay, will follow them. Uh, the verse 12, it says, because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. Uh, they say that lawlessness refers to God's word and refers to the perfect law of the Jewish people. Well, by definition, lawlessness goes against God's law. Now, there are some things, there's no doubt, that in verse 16 it says, 
let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. So you say, well, that deals with Israel, but it doesn't deal with all of Israel. It just deals with who? Those who are in Judea. So, yeah, I guess those in Judea. Well, and then the, we know that the Great Tribulation that's mentioned in verse 21 is specifically the Great Tribulation against, that's also mentioned in Revelation 7, 9, and seven fourteen. So... Against who? I'm sorry, you cut out a little bit right there. Uh, it's the Great Tribulation mentioned in verses 21 and 22 is the same as the Great Tribulation that's mentioned in Revelation 7, 9, and seven fourteen. And then the after the immediately after the tribulation, that's parallel with Revelation six, twelve through seventeen. And then when he talks about elect gathering his elect from the four winds, down in verse thirty one, from one end of the sky to the other, it's Revelation, you know, again seven nine with the multitudes. And then it can also be, I think, linked to Revelation fourteen verses 14 through 16 with his reaping. So I don't think Revelation 14 is chronological. I think that's showing the reaping of the elect and then the reaping of uh, God's trip, you know, God's wrath. Right. Yeah. So. We, I, I, I think you're absolutely right. There's one point that's made right here. They'll say, well, the verse that talks about uh, Verse 20, pray that your flight may not be in winter on the Sabbath. Well, since it's the Sabbath, the fleeing on the Sabbath would only bother a Jew and not a Gentile. So that's the reason that this whole passage is addressed, addressed strictly to Jews. Well, that's not true because he says, let those in Judea. And that, that passage right there is following up those in Judea fleeing to the mountains. Well, those that are going to be fleeing from Judea and the, fleeing to the mountains will be Jewish. But the, in Revelation 12, what do we learn? that the dragon will come after the woman and her offspring, those that keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. And so there was just a, a lot of examples of that type of thing. So I, I know what they meant by saying what you learned about Israel, but uh, the, the way that it's laid out, I think it really, really it wasn't even very subtle. Uh, you need to be careful of that kind of thing. Uh, we do see some things here <clears throat> that, he gets more detail about that we've already talked a good bit about, about what's going to happen when Christ comes with the sun, moon, and stars. And uh, Don't worry about going in the inner room in the wilderness and all that. Uh, the Lord says it's going to be like this. Uh, if you see vultures, you know there's something dead laying around. It's going to be the same way. There's not going to be any uh, mistake in the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ because the sun, moon, and stars are going to whack. And, and then he will come really in the radiance of his glory, just the blinding glory. Now, anyway, so I'm going to get off my high horse uh, about that. I was sort of perturbed by that question. Can you tell? Uh, now, uh, what, what did we learn in Zechariah 12 uh, through 14? <laughs> my goodness, so much here. Um, what was the main thing that was being said in Zechariah 12? Yeah, that's probably the, the bottom line, Rachel, in that day, in that day, in that day. <clears throat> and all these in that days, is it talking about the same day, one day, a period of time, or what? Yeah, I'm thinking it is, Kimberly. I'm thinking it's the, the day of the Lord. Not just one particular day, but the day of the Lord begins. Uh, really, the day of the Lord begins after the opening of the sixth seal and before the seventh seal. The church is snatched away. The church is raptured. The church is raptured. And really, one can say that the rapture of the church is what brings forth the day of the Lord. But I think they start on the same day. 
think the picture is Noah in the same way that God locked the door and locked them in on the same day that he locked them in and started raining. Same thing will happen. Yeah, you notice that the Lord will save Judah first. And he, why did he say he's going to do that? In order that the glory of the house of David uh, and uh, the glory of the house of the inhabitants of Jerusalem would be greater than the house of Judah. Yeah, it, it makes a lot more sense because of that. See that the uh, Lord will take care of Judah. What else did you learn about in that day? There's the piercing thing. So you see the nation's going to be surrounded Jerusalem. You see God's going to destroy. Yeah, great morning. What was that morning about, Kimberly? Not just morning, but great morning. See what they've missed? Yeah, because of the one that appears and they rejected, they mourn for themselves. So keep on going. What about chapter 13? Remember, there's another chapter that we I wonder why that's happening just with you, Karen. That's sort of weird, isn't it? Going in and out. Oh, am I? I'm sorry. I, I don't know why it's doing I will try to talk slower. It may be that. Oh, it could be. I'm trying to get them to upgrade this thing. <laughs> Usually everybody's gone by now, but I don't know. What does 14.6 say? Oh, yeah, no, no light, no luminaries will dwindle. <laughs> so what does the Lord do for his people in uh, Zechariah 13? Yeah, Karen, I bet that's the same thing that was happening with me with uh, Sabrina a while ago. She was cutting out it was like half a word every now and then. Yeah, the people will be washed. They'll be cleansed. Cleansed of their, uh, I think the first verse said sin, of their impurity. And God will separate every idol and remove the prophets and unclean spirits from the land. What did you learn about the prophets from this chapter? That's what So uh, you're saying, Sabrina, that the false prophets were their sons? That um, it's that even if the false prophet is their son, they won't tolerate that and would rather that they'll just stand for righteousness. Yeah, what's being said there is that the day is coming, and, and I think it's speaking of the time when the Lord, uh, when the Lord Himself comes, comes. So there's no need for what the prophets. So He's going to remove the prophets, and He may be referring strictly because it says uh, verse two, 
I will remove the prophets and the unclean spirit from the land. So he's sort of tying them together, uh, whether these are uh, false prophets. Either way you go, you realize that they are false prophets. And so it, I thought it was sort of funny where it says that the false prophets will say, uh, somebody will ask him about it, say, hey, are you a prophet? Go, oh, no, no, man, I'm just a farmer. I don't do anything like that. Uh, verse 6 there, Sabrina, I saw, uh, Rachel, I saw where you said that a while ago. Um, it says this, and one will say to him, what are these wounds? Then he, will say, then he will say, those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. So what does that mean? Mm. Yes, and I ask y'all first, so you have to answer. Here's my answer. Yeah, I was looking at that earlier today, and I thought, man, I wish I had more time to chase that around, but I really don't. Maybe Karen and Sabrina are giving us a <clears throat> Yeah, then it moves into that. Uh, I don't know how your Bible is, but mine has uh, verses 7, 8, and 9 indented like they do little poems. You know? So Sabrina's saying this is, this. is that prophesying of Christ? Uh, should that be capitalized? And so being uh, somewhat like a Isaiah 53 type of passage. Uh, it may be. I, I really don't know. It would be. It would make sense. Yeah. So what is uh, prophesied or stated here in verses 7, 8, 9? House of the Friends, yeah. Yeah, so third, two thirds cut off and a third saved. Uh, and it's, it's uh, I think the two thirds are cut off because of the attack of the evil one of the Antichrist. A third will be left behind. But wait, what do you learn about this third that's left behind in verse nine? Yeah, the Lord's one. The Lord brings them through, refined by fire, refined as silver, tested as gold. They will call on his name and he'll answer. They're his people, yeah. And you'll hear this quoted all the time, but you see the context now. They are my people, and they will say, the Lord is my God. Uh, so what's uh, the main thing that's going on in chapter 14? Just continuing the flow. Picks up the first verse, behold, the day is coming. And what's being spoken about here? It's going to be a, a, a battle. Who's battling? Yeah, the nations will come against Jerusalem. It's interesting. It says, "I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem." The battle, but it says the city will be captured, the houses plundered, women's ravaged, and half the city exiled, and the rest of the people will not be cut off from the city. When does that occur? And then verse four, of course, yeah. <laughs> and then there's verse four. 
Um, let me point something out here before we move to verse 4, because verse 4 is great. Nobody ever pays any attention to verse 4. Uh, Y'all have to hang on a second. My computer is really slow here. No, I'm not too sure it's not the Adobe Connect. Uh, I'm trying to do something here, and I'm getting the beach ball spinning. Well, it was worse than that. Would you believe that my power supply uh, died on this computer? It's a notebook computer. Power supply died at 11 this morning. And I thought, well, I'll order one and get it here tomorrow morning. I can do that computer for a day. And then I went, oh, wait, I got class tonight. So I'm actually using my wife's, which really doesn't have the amperage that it needs, but it's sort of keeping up with everything. This right here, I'm not going to take time to read it right now, but make sure you download this or uh, go back and read it at some other time. Because I think this is really, really important. We haven't really done enough study to get into it yet, and somewhere along the way I'll make a bigger deal of it. But a lot of times we see these battles that take place in that day, and we think that they're all the same battle, and they're not. And people get really confused. You have a Jerusalem campaign right here where Jerusalem will be uh, surrounded. There's a, uh, one that's referred to as Jehoshaphat because it takes place in the valley of Jehoshaphat and then Armageddon. There are three different things, and they're not the same thing. Quite often you'll see uh, sort of what the precept people did in chapter 14. And I, you know, and I appreciate what they're doing because they say it, and they say all these things this way. It says, uh, it seems that this chapter fills in the details of the battle back in Zechariah 12. Well, maybe, maybe not. Uh, yeah, it, you're right. So see, that's the kind of stuff we're paying attention to. It says the day is coming. And from the perspective of when, when he said it, or is it a different day or what? And then you look at sort of the details of it, and then you look at the stuff that happens with this and line that up with the rest of the Scripture, and it starts painting a different type of picture of some things. Yeah, then verse 4 goes back and says, in that day. What is the Lord going to do there in verse 4, Karen? Well, Karen's already said, the Mount of Olives will be split in two. How? It really is, Karen. It's lining up in this a huge amount of scripture that speaks to these things and getting the sequencing. Yeah, it says that the, uh, the Lord himself will come down, will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem, on the east, and the Mount of Olives will be split in the middle from east to west to create a very large valley so that half the mountain will move toward the north and the other half toward the south. It says that the Lord, his feet will stand on it, and it will split like this. And then it says this, And you will flee by the valley of my mountains, for the valley of the mountains will reach to Azil. This is the path, the highway to Azil. And you will flee just as you fled before the earthquake in the day of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come and all the holy ones with him. So, yeah, Karen, what's happened here? He's providing a way of escape for the people to the way of Azil. And we will see more about that later. Who are the holy ones? Yeah, Rachel, it's easy to ask those kind of questions when you're sitting down under on the other side of the world. <laughs> I think it's actually described, did he say, <clears throat> my holy ones? All the holy ones. Yeah, there it is. All the holy ones with him. Oh, well, it says, then the Lord my God will come. And all the holy ones. And which part of the coming is that referring to? Uh, so is the Lord already here because it says his feet are on Mount Zion, or is he coming? And then it says in verse 6, And in that day, come back on that day, there will be no light, the luminaries will dwindle. But then you have to continue on reading on, verse 7, For it will be a unique day which is known to the Lord, neither day nor night, but it will come about that at evening time, 
there will be light. It will come back in that day that living waters will flow out of Jerusalem, half of them toward the eastern sea, another half toward the western sea. It will be in summer as well as in winter. But you got summer and winter in that day. So is verse 5, Rachel wants to know, is that the gathering of the elect, or is that the elect after they've been gathered? But it comes after the split of the mountain because the Lord is making a way for some people to escape. He says you will flee just as you fled before the earthquake. Uh, saw, we saw mountains and islands being uh, gone away in the seals and the trumpets and the bows. Uh, they said all sorts of things happen with earthquakes and great earthquakes. I think the intriguing thing for us to hang on to about this passage right here is where it is, the Mount of Olives, that the Lord is standing on top of it, and that the splitting of the mountain had a purpose. It was providing a way of escape. Providing a way of escape. Yeah, there was a great earthquake involved with the sixth seal. That, that's the sixth seal right there in Revelation. In the spring. In verse 9, the Lord will be king over all the earth. In that day, the Lord will be the only one, his name, the only one. So we see right here that I think in that day, from what we've just read in verses 4 through 9 right there, that it's a process. Okay? I think that whole thing about this day, that day, is speaking of the day of the Lord. Oh, we know what you're saying. Close enough, right? Uh, I tell you what, let me just pick it up here in verse 9 again. Let's just read the rest of this out. This is just, uh, I'm amazed at the number of uh, books on prophecy and end-time things that never, ever deal with uh, minor prophets, major prophets, or Zechariah. I mean, how can you not deal with chapters 12 through 14? So here's verse 9. And the Lord will be king over all the earth. And that day the Lord will be the only one, and his name the only one. All the land will be changed into a plain. From Gibeah to Ramon, south of Jerusalem. Now we we've seen that will happen in various things with the seals and the trumpets and stuff with the earthquakes and great earthquakes and the islands being being driven from the sea. But Jerusalem will rise and remain on its site from Benjamin's gate as far as the place of the first gate to the corner gate and from the tower of Hananel to the king's wine presses. That's rather precise right there. But and Jerusalem's going to do what? It's going to rise up, and people will live in it, and there will be no more curse, for Jerusalem will dwell in security. Well, you're, you're seeing that we're talking about a time frame here now, okay? Uh, a lengthy time frame. Verse 12. Now, this will be the plague which the Lord will strike all the peoples who've gone to war against Jerusalem. So we're backing up, doing a little recapitulation right here, finding out what's going to happen with it. Their flesh will rot while they stand on their feet, and their eyes will rot in their sockets, and their tongue will rot in their mouth. Well, that looks like that Indiana Jones movie. The one with the, got the Ark of the Covenant. Of course, when people read that nowadays, what do they think? It doesn't sound good. Don't you want to be around for that? What's your initial thought when you see that type of description? Not what, you know, isn't that interesting? I hadn't thought about that. Huh. Could be. We really don't know. I remember, um, I don't know when, five years ago. It says their flesh will rot while they stand on their feet. You know, that's sort of a nuclear kind of thing. If your flesh rots, your eyes rot, your tongues will rot in your mouth. Or what happens with a nuclear explosion? But see, it's the Lord that's striking them with this. So the Lord can strike with anything. And I'm really trying more and more to resist the temptation of saying, oh, it must be this or it must be that based upon what's happening in our lives today. So verse 13, it will come about on that day that a great panic from the Lord will fall on them and they will seize one another's hands and the hand of one will be lifted against the hand of the other. And Judah also will fight at Jerusalem and the wealth of all the surrounding nations will be gathered, gold and silver and garments in great abundance. So also, like this plague will be the plague on the horse, the mule, 
camel, the donkey, and all the cattle that will be in those camps. Then it will come about that any who are left of all the nations that went up against Jerusalem will go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to celebrate the Feast of Booths. What do we learn in verse 16 right here? Okay, Sabrina, yeah. It's still down. Okay, thank you, Karen. Yeah, well, you know we're in the midst of the days of all right now. Rosh Hashanah was this last week. Yom Kippur is upcoming, I think, this weekend. So this is what we've talked about, how there's going to be nations that survive all the things that happen. All the poor and forth of the bows, the trumpets, and everything. There's going to be some of those nations. They will enter into that millennial reign. And I think that goes to Matthew 24 and the sheep and the goats. Verse 17. It will be that whichever the families of the earth does not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, there will be no rain on them. They have a choice. So what does that tell you, Serena? Um, yeah, I think you're both right. It shows us that in the millennial reign, when the Lord is reigning himself, that those of the nations who enter in, that they have the choice of being obedient or not being obedient. They have the choice of sinning or not sinning. And they will. There will be some that will refuse to go up. And it gives an example of Egypt right here. If they refuse to go and worship the Lord at the Feast of Booths, then there's no rain. Verse 18, And if the family of Egypt does not go up or enter, then no rain will follow them. It would be the plague with which the Lord smites the nations if they do not go up to celebrate the Feast of Booths. Priest Trister. <laughs> and, and what is the Feast of Booths a picture of? Well, it's the presence of the Lord, right? The Lord being among us. Last three verses. This will be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all the nations who do not go up to celebrate the Feast of Booths. In that day, there will be inscribed on the bells of the horses, holy to the Lord, and the cooking pots in the Lord's house will be like the bows before the altar. And every cooking pot in Jerusalem and in Judah will be holy to the Lord of hosts. And all who sacrifice will come and take of them and boil in them. And there will no longer be a Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts in that day. I think it's just great that the, uh, the book ends with those words, in that day. So you see things right here which are so often not known or not understood uh, are, are not, you don't realize what's happening. There will be sacrifice in that time. I'm wondering, what form does that sacrifice take? And there's cooking pots, okay? Well, and them. Oh, yeah. Okay, so anyway, I, hey, I'm, I'm stopping. I'm reaching the end now, okay? Y'all have any questions? Got a questions about everything. Right? Anything you'd like to share about what we do? I just looked up and saw what time it was. Don't want to be on the. Both typing something here. Must be a long, long something on my computer's not held up. Okay, there we go.
Yeah, don't you love it? You get, you get some answers about some things and 10 more questions pop up. Well, let me pray for us here, folks. I've got a, another appointment. Here in about five, five minutes. <clears throat> okay. So, Lord, I thank you for the word. Through your prophet, these thousands of years ago, which gives such insight to that which is yet to come. And Lord, and, and, and we do see, but dimly through a piece of glass. But we thank you for that. 